But regardless of watching the show or not, I'm sure you've looked at enough memes to know who this guy is. Um, Tiger King. Um, Tiger King. This is Joe Exotic. He's a weird dude. Um, he's not a great stand-up citizen either. Um, he got, got a lot of felonies. I think he's still in jail, actually, to be completely honest. Um, but maybe you know who this guy is. So basically, he had this compound of tigers. And uh, he was not the first guy um, to, to really take tigers into his home, into his backyard, and, and try to make them pets. And actually, um, there was this famous guy in Canada. He, his name uh, was Norman Buwalda. Norman Buwalda. And he was kind of the OG tiger king. Um, he was in a small town in Ontario, Canada. And uh, he loved tigers. He was actually a part, um, the chairperson of the CEA. OA, the Canadian Exotic Animal Ownership Association. So he was an advocate for trying to allow Canadians to have pets like lions, like tigers, like these um, exotic animals at their home. And really the whole goal of this association that he was a part of, that he was help leading, was to try to domesticate these exotic animals. Domesticate. Uh, domestic is the idea of home. Domesticate is to take something wild and to allow it to be brought into a home, allow it to live in close association with humans. And so he was trying to do, um, he was trying to domesticate uh, these tigers. And uh, in 2004, he's got this little exhibit in his backyard. In 2004, there was a 10 year old boy that was taking some pictures, um, taking some pictures of the tiger. He was walking around the tiger with a leash and the tiger is 650 pounds or so. The tiger just busted off the leash and just ate this dude's throat. Um, and so, th- shockingly, this 10-year-old boy, he survived this attack, this mauling from this tiger, but the, basically the tiger ripped out of his throat. Um, so he had to like be um, like tube-fed for the rest of his life. Um, he's, I think, still alive, um, but he's had to be tube-fed for the rest of his life because this guy and his tiger... Um, exhibit. So uh, a lot of people in Ontario, they were outraged. The The neighbors around him were outraged of this. And so they tried to pass this law to make having exotic animals illegal. And actually they got this law to, to pass. And so it went up, um, you know, and it became legal and everything like that. And uh, was apparently it was a poorly written law. So this guy, Norman Buwalda, he basically sued his way all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada to continue to have his tiger exhibit at home. And so the deal was after we went literally all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada to be able to keep five tigers at the end of it. So he was legally allowed to keep five tigers. So he had five tigers. And uh, one day in 2010, he was cleaning the cage of one of his 650 pound Siberian tigers. And uh, he never came out because the tiger mauled him to death. And his family came in to the exhibit later that day to find his body basically eaten by this tiger that was uh, one of his pets. And it's just an ironic story of this OG Tiger King who fought to try to make it legal for people to have exotic animals like this um, at their house and in their backyard. And ironically, he ended up getting killed by one of these one of these powerful tigers that he was trying to domesticate. He was trying to make his pet. And I think that's so, uh, it's so crazy that the neighbor, um, as all of this happened, um, they went and interviewed uh, his neighbor. Um, and this is what his neighbor said about him. Uh, they said he was one of the neighbors that didn't like him, obviously, because he's got you know, illegal activity going on in his backyard. This neighbor says, we were always concerned that he was uh, just not diligent as to the dangers or being responsible for animals of that kind. You don't just take children in and flash pictures at these kind of animals. I think there's a powerful truth right there in that statement from the neighbor that tigers are not supposed to be pets. It's very clear. These 650 pound tigers that can literally rip your body to shreds, kill you in a heartbeat basically, they should not be kept as pets because they are powerful, they are strong, and they are dangerous. You cannot domesticate these type of of exotic big animals. See, my fear is that lots of people in this room are doing what this guy did with tigers, but you're doing it with something that is much more powerful than tigers. You're doing it with God. You're domesticating God. See, God is powerful. God is dangerous in many ways. We should be fearful of God, yet some of you make God a small deal. You make church a small deal. You make God a little tiny sliver of your life and he's not really that big of a deal to you. You domesticate God. You bring him from power and dangerous and, 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 and might and almighty down to just some, some little sliver part of your life. You cannot domesticate a, a tiger. You cannot domesticate 
God. Today we're going to study uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, where it's going to teach us that very thing. You cannot bring God, who is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, that he is the God most high, he is God almighty. You cannot bring him down to your level because he is God, he is powerful, he is big, and you are small and I am small. We cannot domesticate God. So I'd love for you guys to open up to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 to make sure that we have a high view of God. We don't have a low view of God. Uh, what this guy, Norman Buwalda, had, he had a low view of tigers. They were, just, they were just in and around his house. They were no big deal. Uh, I, I feel like if you have a tiger, you should have a high view of a tiger. You should have fear of a tiger. You should put them behind a cage in a zoo with maximum security so that they cannot eat you while you're trying to look at him or take pictures of him. He had a low view of tigers and ultimately paid the price. And so Ecclesiastes chapter 5 is going to teach us that we cannot have a low view of God. God is not our pet. He is not our, uh, he, he is our friend, but he's not our friend in the sense of he's on our level. He is much bigger, much more powerful, much higher than us. So we want to make sure that we treat God as such. So let's read the first seven verses, Ecclesiastes chapter five. We understand here how big, how powerful, how high, how almighty God is this evening. Ecclesiastes chapter five, starting verse one. It says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know what they are doing is evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. For when you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it. For he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, but God is the one whom you must fear. This text here is teaching us this evening that you need to make sure that you do not have a low, small, insignificant view of who God is. Last week, we talked about really the vanity of you being isolated, you being alone, you not having relationships with other, peop- uh, with other people. Your relationships with other people are very important. But tonight, he gets into the most important relationship that you can have here on planet Earth is your relationship with God and your relationship to God. God is God. You are not. God is powerful and you are small. It's really important that you make sure that God is big in your mind and not small. This famous quote um, from A.W. Tozer, maybe you've heard of him before. He's got this famous quote um, in in his famous book, Knowledge of the Holy. And I think it's really important because it really hits on what we're talking about here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. This is what he says. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Whatever comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. If you have a high view of God and you think of God, you think majestic, you think powerful, you think omnipotent, you think sovereign. You think, wow, he is God, I am not. He is big, I am small. Therefore, I must be a worshiper of him. I must serve him, I must obey him. But if God is just some small part of your life, if he's insignificant to you, if he's just something that you talk about or think about on Wednesday or Sunday morning, that, that tells you everything you need to know about yourself and about your view of God. What Solomon does here in our text is he reveals the people that have a low view of God. And I think some of those people are sitting here in this room tonight. Make sure that you do not have a low view of God. I'd love for you to write it down this way for point number one. Inspect your life for a low view of God. Inspect your life for a low view of God. Inspect your life for a low view of God. I'll break down what that means here in a second. He's going to explain a few ways that would show in your life that you think of God as insignificant. You think of God as your pet tiger. He's not that big of a deal. He's not that powerful to you. Treating God with not the respect that he deserves. There's so many uh, ways that you can make God small in your mind many ways that churches and people will talk about how small or insignificant God is. A couple that you know, are pretty prevalent in our society. 
threw them on the screen here. Uh, some people talking about God, talking about Jesus. So you see these t-shirts, Jesus is my homeboy. He's just, a, he's just a buddy of mine. He's just a friend. Or the girl version, Jesus is my boyfriend, whatever that means. I literally don't even know what that means because um, that's kind of weird. Another way that people bring God down is they use his name as an expletive. Just as a passing word to react to something scary or, or funny or surprising. And they use phrases like OMG or oh my God. Or people will name Jesus Christ when they react to something. And what you're doing when you do something like that is you're bringing God from high, most high down to insignificant, just a cuss word, just a reaction. His name means nothing to you. Another way that you can domesticate God is you can come on Sunday and worship and praise God and sing praises with your lips, then go out into the rest of the world and live the way that you used to live. Live like the rest of the world, not treating God, not obeying God, not treating him with the respect that he deserves. So maybe some of these pinpoint in your life, never, ever, ever, ever be complacent with using God's name as a cuss word, using his name as an expletive. Not even just, oh my God, but OMG. Reacting with G's. What is G's? G's is a short way to say Jesus as an expletive, as insignificant, not a big deal to you. Having a low view of God. If you've got a low view of God, you're going to probably have a lot of sin in your life. It's going to show up in your life. No one admits that they have a low view of God. No one in this room is like, yeah, I, I think I have a low view of God. I want a low view of God. You have a low view of God. It shows up in your life. It shows up in the way that you live. It shows up in your relationship to sin. And it even shows up in the way that Solomon's going to explain here in a second. It shows up in the way that you try to fake obey God. You, you mindlessly obey God. Look back at verse number one with me. We'll get back to the positive at the beginning in, in a few minutes for point number two, but talking now about a low view of God, look at what it says. It says, to draw near to listen is better than to offer a sacrifice for fool, of fools, for they do not know that what they are doing is evil. There's this picture of a fool offering a gift, doing something good for God, and just mindlessly not thinking about what they're doing. So for sub point A, point number one, Put down mindless religious routines. That is a way that you can identify in your life if you have a low view of God, if you mindlessly do religious things. Mindless religious routines. This offer, uh, this fool offering a sacrifice, he's just doing it to do it. He's just, it's just something that he's mindlessly doing. Maybe because he feels like he needs to do it, maybe he's just trying to check a box. This picture of sacrifice, the Old Testament, they would bring these animals to the altar or to the, to the temple or to the tabernacle and uh, they, would, they, they would give a sacrifice to God out of worship. We don't have to do that anymore. Jesus is now our sacrifice. We need to offer these physical sacrifices. The Bible talks about the sacrifice that you owe to God is, is the way that you, uh, the, the, the way that you respond to, to sin, the, 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 the heart that you have. Psalm 51, verse 16 through 17, explains that you giving a sacrifice, you doing a good thing is not really what God wants. God wants you to have a, a repentant heart. Psalm 51, 16 and 17 says, for you, referring to God, God, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Basically what he's saying is, we're not giving sacrifices to God as animals or just doing things. What God is really interested in is not you doing things for him. It's really your, your heart behind it. New Testament describes this idea. If you're a Christian, you are now a living sacrifice. Your whole life is now a worship song, if you will, to God. Your life is to live out your new identity of being a slave of God by obeying him. So what he's confronting here is the person that just does a lot of church things, a lot of church kid things, like go to church. A lot of you guys have been going to church since you were babies. That's just what your parents brought you to. Go to church, I go to church, I go to church. But really, is your, is your heart in it? Is it something that you're actually interested in? What about small groups? You just show up to small groups on a Wednesday night just because you have to, just because your parents drove you here? Maybe some of you try to read the Bible 
and you just do it because you know you should. Some of you pray just because you know you should pray. Oh, it's just something that a Christian should do, so I don't know, I'll just pray for 30 seconds and call it a night. Maybe some of you serve. You serve at foundations. You serve in kids' ministry. You serve at Camp Compass. You serve at Compass Carnival. You do good things for God, but you just do it out of just, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I have to do. This is what my parents want me to do. You're mindlessly just going through the motions, religious routines. If you have a low view of God, then those things that you do for him mean pretty much nothing to you. You're just going through the motions, insignificant to you. If the way that you go to church is out of dread or out of, oh, I have to, it's kind of like what you do, I'm sure, on your way to school. Is anyone on your drive to school just thinking, man, I can't wait for school today. I love school so much. I would love to sit through six periods of, of class and do homework all day. Like, I just can't wait for school. I don't think anyone in this room is like that. You start going on your way to school and what do you, what do you want to do? You just are thinking about what you're going to do after school. You want to be done with school already. You're in first period and you're already thinking about what it will be like to be at snack or be at lunch or be home already. Be done with your homework. I'm sure on your drive to school, you just want to get it over with. What does your drive to church look like? Is it just trying to, oh man, I just get over it. I'm sure if I grit my teeth long enough, I mean, I'm going to, I dread it. I don't really like it. I want you to ask yourself the question tonight. What does that really reveal about your heart? What does that really reveal about the way that you view God? Is God important to you? If so, then church is a big deal. Why do you want? Why should you go to church? Even even ask yourself that question. Why do I? Why should I go to church? Why do I want to go to church? Why should I go to church? Ultimately, you should want to go to church because you want to know God. If you're a Christian, it means you love God. It means you want to know Him better. You want to learn from His Word. You want to live differently because of what His Word says. How do you even prepare for the way that you come to church? Is it just you do it because you have to? You read your Bible because you have to. You pray because you have to. You serve because you have to. You do good works in front of other people because you have to. Or is it something that is important to you? The implication here is that this fool is just doing it to just do it. He doesn't even realize that he's a fool. And look at what it says. Look back at verse number one. The end of verse number one. It says, uh, John here to listen is better than to offer a sacrifice of fools for they do not know that they are doing evil. The fool is living like a fool on Monday through Saturday, and then on Sunday, he's trying to live like a Christian. What is the biblical word for that? You're a Christian on a Sunday, and you are a non-Christian the rest of the week. What's the word for that? Biblical word for that. It starts with an H. Hypocrite. Hypocrite. He's calling out a hypocrite right here. And he's saying, if you are a hypocrite, a mindless hypocrite, then you have a low view of God. So write that down for sub point B, mindless hypocrisy. Inspect your life for a low view of God. One of the things for you to look for is mindless hypocrisy. Some of you are hypocrites because you want to be hypocrites. Some of you are mindless hypocrites. You just don't even think about it. You're just a chameleon wherever you are. At church, I act like a Christian. At, at school, I just act like, a, like any of my other friends just mindlessly just going back and forth and back and forth. And you know how to throw a mask on at church. But at school, you're a completely different person. At church, you can throw that mask on and look like a Christian, but then you go back to school, it's just you fit in with everyone else. You love the world. You act like the world. You talk like the world. And there's nothing different about you other than you wear a CSM t-shirt to school sometimes. There's nothing different about your life. There's nothing different about your vocabulary. There's nothing different about your jokes. What does that say about you? The Bible says you're a hypocrite. God hates hypocrisy. God hates hypocrisy. You can write down Matthew 6, Matthew 6, 1 through 2. It says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have, uh, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. If you do good things at church so that other people can see you, congratulations. That's all you get is what this text is telling you. There's no reward. There's no eternal rewards. Treasure waiting in heaven for you. And you know what? You can do a great job at fooling me that you're a Christian. You can do a great job of fooling your leader that you're a Christian. 
You can do a great job. Even some of you, you're so good at it that you can fool your own parents that I'm a real Christian. But you know what? You know you're not. You know you're just throwing on a mask. And guess who you can't fool? Guess who you can't fool? You can't fool God. Throwing a mask on at church. What, what, seriously, what is that going to get you? Matthew 6 says, you've already received your reward. You're not getting anything from God other than a fearful expectation of judgment. Hebrews 10 says, a fearful expectation of judgment. This fool here in Ecclesiastes, he's giving sacrifices, but doesn't even realize that what he is doing is offending God. He doesn't even realize he's, he's doing evil. Maybe right now you don't realize that you're doing evil because you're flipping and flopping and flipping and flopping between church and the world. Truthfully, I don't really care how you act at CSM. I really care how you act at home. I really care how you act at school. I really care how you act when no one's watching and there's no accountability for what you do. So you think. I care way more about that person than the person that's here at CSM acting like a Christian changing their conversation topics when I show up or whatever. Like I care way more about who you are at home, who you are at school and who you are with the door closed because that's who you really are. You're not really the person that you, you you get your mask on here at CSM. See doing good things, good spiritual things with bad motivations, with a bad heart. You're just trying to fool people. You're not tricking God. He goes on to say, even the way that you talk to God matters as well. You can have a low view of God by talking to him. Look at verse 2. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 2 says, Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. What he's trying to say here is that when you talk to God, some of you do it mindlessly and you're just, saying things you don't even understand what you're saying and he says that's a foolish thing to do that's a low view of god write this down for sub point c is mindless prayer mindless prayer that's another indication that you've got a low view of god is this is just when you talk to god when you pray it's just it's just mindless you're just doing it to do it you're you're not really you don't have your mind engaged in it look back at this verse it says for he gives the reason for why this is stupid to just let your heart be hasty to utter words before God and be rash with your mouth before God. He says, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. It's a reminder of who God is, how sacred God is, and how small and insignificant you are. So even this idea, which again, this verse in verse three is very confusing. <laughs> Some of the commentaries that I have don't even comment on this because they don't even know what it means. Um, so it's Hard to understand, but basically this idea of for dreams comes with much business and a fool's voice with many words. It's this picture of just, you're just saying nebulous things. It's just things not rooted in reality. And maybe when you pray, you just toss up phrases that you don't even understand what you're saying because you've heard them at church. You've heard them used by your parents. You've heard them used by your leaders, something like that. So easy for church kids to get in the religious rituals of saying the quote unquote right things when you pray. Jesus doesn't like that either. We don't have time to turn there, but you can write down Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. What Jesus does in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, is he explains that God is not interested in your spiritual phrases. Uh, He says, uh, just tossing up empty phrases to the Gentiles. You're just saying spiritual, um, spiritual prayer things and, you know, using words like, uh, God, blessings and... You know, praise you, God, and I am here to glorify you. And you're just tossing around words you don't even really understand what they mean. God's not interested in that. So the point of really this text right here is to to pray like you mean it. Pray with your mind engaged. Like you are you really mean it. You're you're convicted of what you're what you're praying, which is truthfully a convicting thing for all of us to think about. We get in these rituals and these habits of praying. But if you don't realize what you're doing and what you're praying, then really he's saying, what's, what's the point? So you need to evaluate how you're praying. Are you alert? Are you watchful? Are you meaning what you're saying? Are you just checking a box? 
because you could be. What does your prayer look like? You're just checking boxes, just doing it to do it? Or is it truly pouring out your heart to God because you truly believe that prayer works? Prayer is powerful. God hears you when you pray. God answers you when you pray. There's just such a good picture in those two things right there. It, an utter dependence upon God or just checking boxes. I'm doing it because I have to. Don't be rash with your words. Don't let your heart be hasty. Just tossing ideas about dreams and many words. The fool's voice has many words. Then he transitions here in verse four. If you look at it with me, another way for you to identify if you have a low view of God. He starts talking about making vows and promises to God. Look back at uh, verse four with me. It says, when you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying, in paying it. For he takes no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let your mouth... Uh, let not your mouth lead you into sin and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice or destroy the work of your hands? And he goes back to this idea of dreams. When dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, just a wastefulness and you trying to make these commitments to God that you don't really follow through with. So write this down for sub point D is mindless spiritual commitments. Mindless spiritual commitments. Specifically what he's talking here is the promises and the commitments that you make to God. Back in the Old Testament, they would do this a lot more. They would uh, make a vow of, uh, God, I'm going to offer you a certain you know, free will offering, or I'm going to make this certain uh, Nazarite vow, or all these different, these different vows that they would have um, in the Old Testament, a vow of allegiance or gratitude or something like that. What he's trying to correct here is you just saying spiritual things and making commitments of things that you know you're not going to end up doing. When you make a hasty commitment before God, you just do it quickly and you don't think about it and you don't follow through with it, what you're doing is you're lying to God. Promising God something, God, I, 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 I'm going to you know, really work on not sinning here. God, help me. I've resolved to, to, to not be this way. And you talk to your smarter about it, but then just, uh, just mindlessly just keep doing it. James 5 verse 12 says, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation. We are called to tell the truth at all times. When you commit to something, spiritually speaking, and you don't do it, especially when you make a commitment to God and you don't follow through with it, it's a big deal. Verse six, he says, let not your mouth lead you into sin. Do not say to the messenger that it was a mistake. There was this uh, picture in this Old Testament where you would uh, make, like, make a commitment to, to um, give some certain offering and then the some messenger from the, temple or from the synagogue would come to to your house to come you know confirm this uh sacrifice or whatever and you just oh whoopsies made a mistake i didn't really mean to make that commitment so it's this idea of lying really i made a commitment i said something before god but i'm not going to follow through with it was the picture how does that play out here in a situation right here on a wednesday night making commitments when do you make spiritual commitments before god Many of you guys do that in small groups. So talk real quickly about small groups. What does small groups look like? When you hop into small groups here after the sermon, you start talking about what you're going to do. You start making goals. You start saying, well, I'm going to read my Bible this week. I'm going to do this. Okay, great. Thursday morning, you read your Bible and then you forget by Friday morning. The rest of the week, you're done. You made a spiritual commitment. Vowing about like you're going to do something and then you don't follow through with it. It's saying that that's a, that's a big deal. Promising something before God and then not taking it seriously. Even the resolutions and the goals that you make, make them seriously. Don't just make goals so that your small group leader thinks you're a good, solid, spiritual person and you just make a goal to make a goal. These things here reveal a low view of God. You can go back to the last slide. Just all these things here looking for mindless religious routines, mindless hypocrisy, mindless prayer, mindless spiritual commitments. These things right here, these four things, what Solomon does here is he puts a mirror in front of your face and says, are you doing these things? Because if so, you've got a low view of God and you need to elevate that. You need to heighten that view of God. He gives a solution of how we heighten our view of God. Really, this is one of the main things that our church is all about. We've got these things called the eight distinctives here at our church. 
eight, you can find them online. They're on the back of the worksheet and everything like that. But number three on the eight distinctives is this. We seek to maintain a high view of God. We try to do that in what we do here at the church. Uh, this is just what the website says, a, 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 an explanation of what that distinctive means. It says, in a day where many have attempted to reduce God to be their spiritual therapist, it is important for us to remember that God, our creator, is the highly exalted, transcendent king of all things. We cannot afford to think less of God than he really is, and we dare not respond to him as merely our comfortable friend or fail to worship him as our sovereign Lord. That is so, so important that you make sure that you never settle for a low view of God, but you're constantly seeking to maintain a high view of God. So write it down exactly like that for point number two. Seek to maintain a high view of God. Seek to maintain a high view of God. That's the solution that he gives us here. Seek to maintain a high view of God. Just like we said last time, in the last point, a low view of God reveals itself in the way that you live. In the same way, a high view of God will reveal itself in the way that you live as well. He teaches us how to give, how to elevate our view of God. So look at point num- or, uh, verse number one, rather. Verse one, Ecclesiastes 5, verse one. This is the solution that he gives us. He starts with the solution, and then at the end of verse seven, he gives us another solution. So he kind of sandwiches these ways to have a high view of God together in this text. So, Ecclesiastes 5 verse 1, it says, guard your steps when you go into the house of God. Guard your steps when you go into the house of God. First way that you can seek to maintain that high view of God, sub point A, is you need to treat church like it's a big deal. Treat church like a big deal. Not just treating church like a big deal, because it truly is a big deal. He says, guard your steps when you go into the house of God. When you go to church, it is uh, the house of God. They were talking specifically of the temple where God literally dwelled in the temple. But when you go to church, there's this special presence of God. The church is God's house. Again, there's nothing special about the gym that we meet in. There's nothing special about this room that we're in right now. But when you go to church, you are entering into the presence of God in a very special and very real way. Titus chapter 3, verse 15 calls the church the household of God. He says, I'm writing these things so you ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. The household of God. Just the way that you think about church, not just the building, because right now it's under construction, but like the concept of church. How do you treat it? Something my dad was very like very serious about when we were kids and we would go you know on vacation or something um, he all you know when we would go into a church it was always very much you need to pay respect because this is a special place so one of the things that he would teach uh me and my brother because we would wear a lot of hats is whenever you go into church take your hat off there's this respect to god and so there was this um time when we were in um when we were in denmark um in, in august and there's this church in, uh, in Copenhagen, right next to where the king, uh, or, yeah, the king, they have a king? Yeah, they have a king now. Denmark has a king, I think. Um, I actually don't really know. Um, but whatever. Literally right down the street from his residence, um, this, this church, um, we went into this church, and it was one of those churches, like, you know, very ornate, very nice, but it was very interesting. Denmark, a very worldly, a very secular, a very truthfully, like non-Christian society, going into that church, like it was flooded with tourists and it was dead quiet in there. There was this utter respect for for the church and for the presence that you were in. And I remember being there, taking my hat off as I walked in the door of this just incredible chapel here that looks like a big rotunda. And I just remember being in there, whispering because it was like, we don't talk loud here in this church. There was this permeating respect for the church. And I was sitting there in that chapel with my hat off and I was like, wow, God's house is different. There's nothing different about this building than the other buildings that I went into in Denmark. But there was something special in the sense of this is a church. There's, it's sacred, sacred, set apart. It's different than other places. The application of this text is not just for you to take your hat off 
but it's really for you to make sure that you approach church cautiously, guarding your steps when you go into the house of God, entering the house of God, entering church with a sense of awe and gratitude and amazement, or is it just another thing on my schedule? Just a place where I get to see my friends, just a place where I get to grab some coffee and a donut. Is church a big deal to you? If it's not, you need to check your heart because it needs to be. It is the most important time of your whole week is going to church. And if you go to church to go sit through a sermon and fall asleep, what are you doing? What are you doing? Kicking up your feet when Pastor Elliot's preaching like it doesn't really matter. I go to church on a Wednesday night. No, you don't. You're going to church on Sunday too. That's a big deal. Treating church like a big deal. Even the way that you come, even what time you go to sleep on Saturday night. One of the old sayings that I've, I've heard is that church always starts on Saturday night. If you go to bed at 1 a.m., 2 a.m. on Saturday night and you're tired for church, that's your fault. That's your fault. Church starts on Saturday night. Even the way that you think about the way that you go to sleep on Saturday night, because I want to be well rested so that I can go to church, I can pay attention, I can hear from God's word so that I can go out and do it. That is something that you need to be a little bit more intentional with. Guarding your steps when you go into the household of God, you're preparing for it. And ultimately, look at verse one. You're preparing for it for this. To draw near to listen is better than to offer a sacrifice of fools. To draw near to listen is such a great thing. So point, uh, sub point B is listen to God. Elevate Seek to maintain a high view of God by listening to God. When you come to church, are you coming to listen to God? You're listening to God's word so that you can go out and do it. There's that picture of being a doer of the word, not a hearer only. The way that you listen has a major effect on how the ability that you will have to be able to do it. If you show up to church and you don't listen, how are you going to put it in practice? How are you going to do anything about it? I love the way that this phrase, uh, Jesus uses this phrase in Luke 8. He says, take care how you hear. Take care how you hear. Luke 8, 18. Take care how you hear. For the one who has, more will be given. The one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. Take care how you hear. The way that you hear and listen to sermons is important. I stand up here every week. I can tell who's engaged with the sermon and who's not. That's when every head just popped right back. Hey, good to see you guys again. Hey, ever, I, yeah, all eyes up front. Like, I can tell how engaged you are. And again, who cares what I think? Who cares if you're fooling me or not? But the way that you listen matters. Are you engaged? Are you taking notes? We give these worksheets to you for a real reason. There's, we're intentional because we want you to take notes so that you can engage your mind in what you're hearing so that you can write down points of application so you can say, oh, I understood this so that now I can do this. Do you take notes? I see some of you on Sunday and you don't pull out anything. You don't take notes at all. The Pastor Elliot sermon. And I don't know why that's the case, why you feel that way. You take notes here. Great. I'm so glad you're taking notes here. That's awesome. But engaging your mind when you listen to a sermon, taking notes so that you can think about it, so you can resuscitate what you're hearing. Taking notes so that you can remember what was said. You're taking notes so that you can even refer back to what you've heard before. Some of you, when you leave here, you leave your notes every week. And I throw my notes of my sermon away in the trash every single week because you guys leave them. And you know what that shows me when you leave them? You don't really care about it because no one left. No one leaves their phone on Wednesday night. Everyone takes their phone home. Why? Because you care about your phone. Your phone is valuable to you. It matters to you. But your sermon notes are just trash worthy. Oh, I'm going to forget it anyway. It doesn't matter. Seriously, even think of the way that you take notes. Maybe it would be good for you to take a journal so that you can have it everything in one place. Not just something that you go home and throw away. I would rather you not throw it away here, but some of you are going to do that and just say, okay, I'm going to throw it away when I get home. Why? Not because I'm the greatest preacher that you've ever heard, because I'm not, but you should be listening. You should be taking notes so that you can do something about it. So you can put it in practice. So you not just be a hearer of the word, but a doer. So come to church so that you can listen to God. And ultimately, you're doing all of this to verse 7, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 7. Look at the punchline of this whole text here. What should you do to elevate your view of God? The last 
couple words of verse 7. It says, but God is the one who you must fear. God is the one who you must fear. Subpoint C, fear God and obey God. How to elevate your view of God? Fear God and obey God. Fear God and obey God. Again, God is God. We are nowhere close to him. We are fearful of him. What does that mean to, to fear God? We toss that word around. To fear God, what does that mean? Fear God is this, this idea of this, this reverential awe of God, his position, his authority, his power. This reverential awe of how authoritative and how powerful he is in your life. Fear God, not in the sense of, I fear that God will send me to hell. If you're a non-Christian, you should fear that. But if you're a Christian, the Bible says that you can't get sent to hell if you're a real Christian. So you don't need to fear hell, the consequences, but you can fear God because he is the judge and he's going to expose everything you've ever done, ever thought, ever said in this life. Ecclesiastes 12, we've referenced it a couple of times. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14. You can write down this. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14 says, For the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, every secret thing, whether good or evil. If you fear God, you sense his authority in your life and you obey him. If you come on Sunday, you come on Wednesday, and you go out home and live like the rest of the world and disobey and sin every week, what you're doing is you're showing that you don't have a high view of God, showing that you don't fear God. You don't fear the consequences for what you do. You don't fear the power and the authority that God has in your life. Fearing God, the way that you can fear him is by obeying him, by submitting to his authority. Again, it's important that we understand our relationship to God. He's not just a piece of the pie. He's not just a part of your life. He is your life. He is everything that you are. He is, you are a slave to him. God is not just your helper. God is not just a vending machine for you to get stuff out of whenever you need it. God is the God of the universe. You are, should be in submission to him. You should treat him as God. You should fear him as God. You should obey him as God. And ultimately, close with this, the quote that we started at the beginning of the night with. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It's something I think we need to sit and really think about and chew on. But you want to hear in a minute in small groups. So let's bow our heads and pray right now. And we'll hop in to this, these questions here tonight. So let's bow our heads and let's pray. God, we thank you that because you are high, you have sent your son to planet earth so that we could have a relationship with you, so that we can know you, so that we can relate to you in this very special way as a child of God. We thank you for that. God, I pray that you would protect every student in this room from a low view of you. God, those students in this room that do not fear you, they do not fear the punishment that they will experience when they die and spend eternity in hell separated from you because of their lifestyle of sin. God, I pray that you would wake them up tonight. You would show them, you would uh, reveal to them the hypocrisy of their life and of their heart. And God, you would cause them to repent of that sin. You would cause them to place their faith in you. So I pray God for every student right now in this room that is not right with you, that is still running from you, that is still living a lifestyle of sin. God, may you save them tonight. May they not wait another night and try to throw on another mask in the next 30 minutes of small groups, but God, may you convict them to take that mask off and say, this is who I am. And God is, is finding me out. God is convicting me through his spirit. And I need to be right with him. I need to fear him. I need to obey him. I need to believe in him, repent of my sins, place my faith in him, and now live differently because of what he did for me on the cross. God, thank you for that truth that we can celebrate that. Thank you for every student in this room that does fear you and that is actively living their life to, in obedience to you. God, may you elevate their view of you so that they might treat your house, God, and they might treat uh, their, their attitudes and, and their service and their praying and their Bible reading um, as such because you are God and you deserve our worship every single day. So we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.